Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way was fatherless I once was fatherless a stranger with no hope your kindness waking me waking me from my sleep your love it beckons deeply a call to come and down by grace now I Take this life, take your life. Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting. From the grave you risen, victoriously into marvelous light. I'm running out of darkness, out of shame. By the cross you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. My dead heart now is beating, my deepest stains now clean. Your breath fills up my lungs. Dead heart now is beating, my deepest stains now clean. Your breath fills up my lips, now I'm free, now I'm free. Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting. From the grave you've risen. Victoriously into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the light, you are the way Lift my hands and spin around See the light that I have found Oh, the marvelous light, the marvelous light. Lift my hands and spin around. See the light that I found. Oh, the marvelous light, the marvelous light. Into marvelous light I'm running. Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way Amen
stays the same. You stay the same through the ages. And your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Cause I know that you love me. Your love never fails. We're the strong and the water's deep. I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Cause I know that you love me Your love never fails He wants what's best for us. Believe these words. And you make all things work together for my good. Yeah, you make all things work together for my good. Yeah, you make all things work together for my good. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Cause I know that you love me, and your love never fails. Your love never fails. Never fails, amen.
dwells within the veil. Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. But through the storm, He is Lord. Drive on living 
before you the demons run and flee and at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am strong language we beg you not to receive this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it what would be the marvelous gift of God's kindness the very word of God understanding the word of God reveals the reality of God and then he says at the end he says the time the right time is now today is the day what does it mean? And again, I put that up there on purpose during the communion time to understand that the Apostle Paul had a sense of urgency about don't ignore what has been given as a gift. Don't ignore the gift. What, what gift? The gift is the Word of God. So now I'll say it again. He says, as God's partners, I beg you not to receive this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. And he says, the right time to open the gift is now. Today is the day. So today we open the gift, and the gift is the Word of God. We continue through the Sermon on the Mount, and understanding that uh, I'll confess it's going to take me eight sermons, eight different weeks to cover one of Jesus' sermons on the Mount. 
So Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has been, this is part six, and uh, let's give you a recap. We've covered Jesus' teaching. We began with the eight steps from the kingdom of men to the kingdom of God. And then we went to Jesus has covered his teaching, talked about the law and anger and adultery and divorce and revenge and enemies. And today we pick up with giving to the needy, prayer and fasting. I've titled this series on purpose, very specifically, what did you say because of this verse, Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will disappear. Think about it. Just... Why would you spend a lot of your treasure on something that one day will be gone? Be a bad investment, wouldn't it? Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. I wonder how many people actually believe that's true, that one day everything we know, the present earth and the present atmosphere surrounding the earth will be gone. The Apostle Peter says it will be burned up in a fire. The Apostle John says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth to be gone. Now, I'm not going to act like I can fully comprehend all that because I don't don't know how I can comprehend it. I just believe that Jesus' words are eternal and one day all this will be gone. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And so if that's true, and I believe it is, why would we pour our treasure, our, our life into something, some things that will one day be gone? Is it possible that we can invest our life in something that will be still here after the fire? Is it possible we can invest our life in something that will remain after the new heaven and the new earth are created? He says that will be based on the word of God. If that's true, and I'm convinced it is, if Jesus' teachings are the only thing that will be remaining after the fire, then I'd say, what did you say? Because it's really going to be important. Here's why. Jesus' teachings will never disappear. They are the way to live. Listen, they are in the first of the prayer, uh, excuse me, the the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about getting from the kingdom of man to the kingdom of heaven. It's like this series of eight steps. But in the Sermon on the Mount, he is clarifying how to live, not just in heaven, but while you're here. The teachings of Jesus, here's where we're going to start today. The teachings of Jesus are not just heaven teaching. They're how you live in the kingdom of men before you get to heaven. They are not just for forever, they are for now. Jesus' teachings are the very foundation of the American society. Do you know that? I know that there are secularists that hate for me to say those words. They despise those words. But the reality is you cannot deny the Judeo-Christian ethic is the foundation of the society of the American culture. Our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, all of these are based upon the Judeo-Christian principles that are found where? In the Bible. Specifically in American culture and the teachings of the New Testament. Jesus' teachings are the foundation of our society. Did you know that the teachings of Jesus are the basis of freedom? So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think a democracy, as we know it in the American culture, can survive apart from the teachings of Jesus? Do you think it can survive if Jesus is removed from the, the civil society? As we begin today, I want you to watch a short video with me that will help us understand as we go through this What Did You Say Sermon on the Mount, what it means to not only have Jesus' words affect eternity, but to have Jesus' word establish the foundation of our present kingdom of men. Watch the video with me. A group of people voluntarily submit to the law. See, our fundamental democracy in the American culture is that people historically have voluntarily submitted to the authority of law, and yet today we see lawlessness. Why? What's happening? I know there's been much debate about a USA Today survey produced this week, 
I've read a lot of commentary on it. And that survey pretty well simply said this, that in the past seven years, there's been an 8% decline in people who claim to be Christian. Now, I'm going to tell you, I kind of read that in a different way than probably most people. I, I don't think there's 8% less Christians. I think that there's been a refining process in the church and people, it's real easy to say you're a Christian, but let me tell you when you'll know that you're a Christian and when you're tested and under opposition. So as the, as the negative influence against Christianity rises, many people who previously would have checked the box Christian now check the box undecided or not. I think the church is unstoppable and it will continue to be unstoppable. But that's not the issue. What is it in the American culture that will restrain evil? What is it in the American culture that will make people obey the law? You see, historically speaking, it's been the accountability to God. Uh, way more than the accountability to government. In fact, the laws of government in our culture were established by the laws of God. So here we are today reading the Sermon on the Mount. For six weeks I've been doing the Sermon on the Mount. And in reality, the Sermon on the Mount is the basis of the fundamentals of the laws of our own land. But if you remove that teaching of Jesus, heaven and earth are going to disappear, but my words are going to be forever. If you could remove that foundation, then what is it that will make people voluntarily obey laws? Nothing. You won't be able to have enough police. Do you think this is new? It's not new. This idea, it's not new. In fact, let me, let me prove it to you. I want to read to you a quote from John Adams, the second president of the United States, instrumental in establishing this form of government, this constitution, this uh, representative republic, democracy that we have in our land. Here's what he said, and I quote specifically. <clears throat> he says, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. And you see what he's saying? Unless there is a morality and a religion that bridles the passion of the human heart, there will be no government that can control those people. And then he says this, our constitution, the American constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other people. So the only way democracy works is when the people voluntarily submit to the law because they acknowledge that there is a law greater than that of government. So they are submitting to the power and authority of God, which is based on what? What did you say? Heaven and earth will disappear, but these words, they will not just be the kingdom of heaven. They will be the kingdom of men. And one day, can I just say this? One day, the restrainer of evil, the word of God, inside the hearts of believers will be removed from the earth. And when that does, Jesus describes it in this way. If those days were not cut short, no human life would remain on the earth. But they will be cut short for the sake of the elect. The Word of God. It is forever. Today we begin the Word of God, chapter 6, asking Jesus one more time, what did you say? Watch out. Don't be, excuse me, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you will lose the reward from your father in heaven when you give to someone in need don't do it as the hypocrites do blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity i tell you the truth they have received all the reward they will ever get but when you give Give to some, when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. So let me, let me start today in this teaching of Jesus, chapter 6, with watch out. Now what if somebody were to walk up to you in five minutes and I said, watch out, what would you do? Now, I'm going to tell you, my instinct would be to duck, because I'm thinking somebody's fixing to hit me, something's swinging out of the out of the ceiling. Watch out means to what? Be aware of your circumstance. Pay attention. Focus. 
What did Jesus want us to focus on? As he starts chapter 6, at least translated to English, he says, watch out. He focuses on good deeds. Good deeds. I hope you all have them. The church is designed to produce them. See, good deeds are like good fruit that comes from a good tree, that comes from a good seed. And I want you to get the, get the, the sequence. That good deeds are like a good fruit that comes from a good tree, that comes from a good seed. The good deeds are the result of good seeds, and they represent the harvest for the gardener. And he's the one who gives the seeds. The watch out message of Jesus isn't about the harvest of good deeds, though, is it? Did you catch it? It's really not about the harvest of good deeds. That's not why he said watch out. You know why he said watch out? It's about taking the credit for the harvest of the good deeds. He said watch out. Let me repeat it. Verse 1. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Do the good deeds. That's clear. He wants the good deeds. Should the church produce good deeds? Yes. But do them without drawing attention to yourself. Why? Because drawing attention to yourself takes the glory from the gardener, and you don't even know how to make seeds. I don't know how to make seeds. Seeds are the, what come from God. And what is the seed throughout the Bible? The seed is the Word of God. What is our emphasis in this, in this teaching? It is the teaching of Jesus, the very Word of God. We receive the seed and then we sow the seed. We don't make seeds, we sow seeds. This isn't just a watch out moment from Jesus. It's a warning from Jesus. You know what the warning is? You'll lose your reward. You'll lose your reward from the gardener of heaven. How would you lose the reward? By sowing good deeds for the purpose of drawing attention to self. You'll lose your reward. What did you say? You'll lose your reward. What did you say? You'll lose your reward. If you touch the glory in the gardens of the earth, you'll lose your reward. So let me ask a question. Would you trade a pat on the back here for a well done from the gardener in heaven? Many people do. In fact, let me give you an example. In my 15 years here, I've had quite a few examples of people who get upset. Can you imagine anybody getting upset in the church? I've had people that get upset in the church, and one of the prime examples of those upset in the church is, I did this and I did that, and you know what? No one ever said a word to me. I'm thinking, you ought to read Matthew 6. No one ever said a word. No one ever said thank you. No one ever did anything. It's just I did it, and it's like nobody even cares. What are you, why did you do it then? Were you doing that for the... Jesus gave you a warning. Jesus said, watch out. Don't you dare do something wanting something right now. In fact, if you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're trying to touch the glory. Would you really trade a pat in the back now for a well done from the gardener? Well, here's why that's a bad deal. Because how long is that pat on the back going to last? <laughs> 35 seconds. How long does the reward from the gardener in heaven last? Forever. What did you say? Jesus says the hypocrites blow trumpets and they draw attention to their good deeds. And in doing so, they get the temporary cheers of the crowd. <laughs> did you see what, hey, did you see what I did? Oh, good job. They get the temporary cheers from the crowd. This is Jesus' teaching. It's a teaching about humility, but it's also a teaching about priority, where you put yourself. You see, the problem is the temporary cheers of the crowd that you desire now will actually be a trade for the eternal promise of reward from the gardener, from God himself. It's a bad trade. Don't do it. Jesus warns, watch out. Instead, he gives us the way to respond. This is what we're supposed to do. Verse 3. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. No one's going to be able to cheer for you if they don't know you did it. When you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. Notice something when Jesus says when you give. He doesn't say if you give. 
So do we bear good deeds? Do we produce good deeds? Yeah, now, that's not the issue. It's not about good deeds. He doesn't say if you give. He says when you give. Give to those who are in need, but do so without drawing attention to yourself. Do it secretly. Do it privately. Why? That's the only way you know for sure that you're not doing it for the wrong reason. You want a way to know for sure that your heart's pure? Do it in secret. And then the only one who's going to be able to know is your father because there are no secrets with him. Give to those in need, but don't look for any response in this lifetime. I think this is great counsel. Whatever you decide to do, whatever you decide to give, whatever there's a need and you decide to meet the need, do it expecting nothing. You'll never be disappointed. And your heart will always be pure because you didn't really expect anything. Not in this lifetime. Don't make the trade. Don't make the trade of getting your reward here and trading in the reward that you would have in eternity. Give and know this, the gardener that gave you a seed to sow knows the heart and the life of every seed sower. And he will reward every seed sower in the eternal kingdom. So I want to say something. I've said it in both services. I want to say something. I'm in a unique position. Will is also in a unique position where there are people in this church, individuals who see a need in the church or maybe connected to the church somehow. And they'll come to either Will or myself, maybe somebody on staff, and say, I want to meet this need, but I don't want anybody to know that it's from me. So they will come and give us something to give to them. And you know why they're doing that? Not so that I would know, but so that the person will never know, but it will be coming through the church. But the person will never know. And that's always the condition, so that no one will ever know where it comes from. Why are they doing that? Let me say this. There are a lot of people in this church that do that. Amy and Will? It happens. There's a lot of people that when there's somebody, I, let me give you a couple examples. There, there are parents that are struggling financially and their kid needs to go to camp or go to a CIY or go somewhere. And, and there are people in this church that they'll come to Will, they'll come to me and say, if you've got any kids that are having any trouble this summer, you just call me and I'll pay for it. They're going on a mission trip. Just, hey, give me, let me know how many you need. And we'll, they, their name is never known. And Jesus says, this is how you give. Because you know what? No one's going to come pat them on the back because absolutely it's a secret. Nobody ever talks about their name. But do you think God notices? Does God know? I want to reveal three fundamental issues on this first topic of giving. You have to let go of something before you can give it. If you think you can give something and never lose control of it, then you don't really understand the whole concept of giving. Giving means you release control. If you think you can give something and retain control, you really haven't given it. You've leased it to somebody. Giving means you give it and you just let go. Number two, you can't give what you don't have, so somebody had to give it to you first. You're not a creator. I'm not a creator. So listen, here's a fundamental truth. Everything that I might possibly ever be able to give away, somebody gave it to me. You know how I know that? Because I am not a creator. And because I am not a creator, I can't create anything in myself. So everything that I might have that I might be able to give to you or somebody else, somebody gave me. And that really brings up number three. Why is it so difficult to let go of something that somebody gave you? So let's just take three things. We call them treasure. Time, money, talents. I can't create time. So far, God's given me 58 years. I can't create talent. He gave me certain abilities. I, I can't create anything. It, it, it comes from him. So why is it so difficult for us to give to someone in need that which somebody gave to me? You know when it becomes a problem? When you think you retain it unto yourself. Or that you created it. Or that it doesn't have its origin in God. When you recognize that everything that you have, somebody gave you, let's call them seeds. That every seed that you might be, have a chance to sow, actually, God gave you the seed free. He just gave you seeds and says, now go sow some seeds. You know, when you have trouble is when you refuse to acknowledge those seeds that you have, your time, talents, and money, or mine. Guess what? They're not yours. God gave them to you. 
And he's going to see what you did with them, those seeds. Can I give you a word from the gardener before we move to prayer and fasting, the other topics? Luke 18, 29, Jesus says, yes, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over. Whatever it is that you were given, one day you might have to give it away. There might be sacrifices in your life, but everything that you have, somebody gave you. You'll be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Those seeds that you got from the gardener that you turn loose of to help someone else will produce a harvest many times over in this life and in the life to come. Those seeds will never, however, listen, here's a spiritual fundamental truth. Those seeds will never multiply. They will never produce until you plant them. And the act of planting seeds is you give them away. You release them. You release them. And by the way, they weren't your seeds anyway. Number two, prayer. What did you say? Prayer. Verse 5, Jesus says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on as the people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. When you give. Not if you give. He said, when you give, don't be like the hypocrites because you'll lose your rewards. And then he turns the page to prayer. And you know what he says? The exact same thing. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. You'll lose the rewards. See, both of them have the same message. When you give, don't be like the hypocrites because you'll trade the eternal reward for temporary rewards. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. You'll trade the eternal reward for temporary rewards. It's a bad trade. You know what both of those are doing? What's the problem? They both draw attention to self. If you give for public praise, you're elevating, glorifying yourself. If you pray for public praise, you're glorifying yourself. Giving and praying are both, listen, best done in private. Why? Our heart wants to touch the glory. Our heart wants to draw attention to self. Giving and praying both have rewards. The question is whether you want the reward short-term, instantaneously, that only lasts a brief moment, or do you want the reward of God the Father? Both have rewards. Let me repeat verse 6. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will, what church, reward you. I want to do something. I want to read, uh, I was reading a morning devotion by A.W. Tozer recently. And you've probably heard me mention his name on several occasions. So I've, I found it would be good if I gave you a little background on him. He actually uh, died probably about the time I was coming into this world. He was leaving this world. Let me read a short bio of this guy who's had an incredible influence on my life and quite frankly a lot of other people's lives by his writings. I never met him. He died before I came of age. But here's what it says when you read his bio. Hailing from a tiny farming community in western Pennsylvania, his conversion was at a teen, as a teenager in Akron, Ohio. While he was on his way home at, from work at a tire factory, he overheard a street preacher say these words. If you don't know how to be saved, just call on God saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Upon returning to his house, after hearing the street preacher say those words, he went into his attic, got on his knees, and he heeded the preacher's advice and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
In 1919, five years after he went to his attic and, attic and called on the name of the Lord, without any formal theological training, this man had been, went to school nowhere, was trained in no way, no shape, no how, except the Holy Spirit entered this man's life. Tozer accepted the offer to pastor his first church, and he was in the ministry for 44 years, and his writings, even today, are affecting maybe millions of people around the world. All because of what? He heard a street preacher say these words, if you don't know how to be saved, just call on God saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. God changed his life. Now, the reason I read that to you is I want to read that morning's devotion that affected me greatly about this topic of prayer. Because the idea of prayer, I'm going to give you a heads up, the idea of prayer is seeking the presence of God. It's not sending a text message to God. It's not sending him an email. It is seeking the very presence of God. Here's what he wrote. Retire from the world each day to some private spot. Even if it be only the bedroom, for a while I retreated to a furnace room for want of a better place. Stay in the secret place until the surrounding noises begin to fade out of your heart and a sense of God's presence envelops you. Deliberately tune out the unpleasant sounds and come out of your closet determined not to hear them. Listen for the inward voice till you learn to recognize it. Stop trying to compete with others. Give yourself to God and then be what and who you are without regard to what others think. Reduce your interests to a few. Don't try to know what will be of no service to you. Avoid the digest type of mind, short bits of unrelated facts, cute stories and bright sayings. Learn to pray inwardly and at every moment. After a while, you can do this even while you work. Practice candor, childlike honestly, honesty, humility. Pray for a single I. Read less, but read more of what is important to your inner life. Call, call home your roving thoughts. Gaze on Christ with the eyes of your soul. Practice spiritual concentration. You know why he's one of my spiritual heroes? This is how you experience the presence of God. Did you know that giving and praying both allow you to experience the reward? And what is the reward? The presence of God. It's not just something that's going to happen in heaven. It's reachable now. The presence of God. What is the present reward of this type of prayer life that Tozer describes, you will know God. It is the treasure. The kingdom of heaven. What's the Sermon on the Mount about? Well, I'm going to tell you. I've still got two weeks after this to finish it, but I'm going to tell you what the Sermon on the Mount's about. It's about access to the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is not a place. The kingdom of heaven is a person. And the person is the presence of God. And the presence of God in the church age is the Holy Spirit. If you want to know God, you'll have to know the Holy Spirit. To know the Holy Spirit, we have been told how to receive the presence of God. Give and you'll get a reward. People read that and say, yeah, I'll, get, I'll get a check in heaven. Now, you'll get a reward in heaven, but I'm going to tell you there's a reward right now. And the reward right now is you'll know God. And when you pray, there's a reward in heaven, but there's a reward right now, and that is you'll know God. You'll experience His presence. His presence is the treasure. His presence is the kingdom of heaven. Don't babble. Jesus said, don't babble. You will never know God through babble. You know what babble is? Going into prayer and just going, meh, 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 meh. That's babble. It's meaningless. You will never know God with babble. Be honest with God. You will never know God by trying to hide your real self. He already knows everything. Why don't you be honest with yourself? When you pray, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, get real. Be like a child. I love to hear children pray. Because, you know, they don't have any false space. 
They just say it. It's in their heart. They just say it. And God says, we need that, we need that childlike honesty, knowing that he already knows. But it's not about sending him a message. It's about having an encounter with him. It's about entering his presence. This what did you say moment from Jesus doesn't make public prayer wrong. Now let me make a real point here. He says when you pray, go into your closet. Does that make public prayer wrong? It doesn't make public prayer wrong. Public prayer was part of the Jewish culture as they began to know God. But the real power of prayer, let me tell you, the real power of prayer is not public prayer. The real power of prayer is private in your closet prayer. That's when, you, that's when he transforms your life. And that's where you get to know who he is and you encounter his presence. And then Jesus does something. And I'm going to say, I wonder, did you know this is in the Sermon on the Mount? We have just described how not to pray. Don't do it like hypocrites. Don't do it publicly. Seek and praise. You'll lose your reward. Go in your closet. And the next verse, verse 9, is the Lord's Prayer. In which Jesus says, pray like this. He didn't just say pray and not give us any instruction. Can I say this? This is personal. So when I say go in your closet, when I say Jesus said go in your closet, this is personal prayer. Let me read it to you and I'll show you what I mean by that. Pray like this, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we forgive, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus' is teaching is to make this prayer, to pray like this. Make this personal, Terry. Make this personal, Dan. Make this personal, Lee. Make this personal. When, when, it, when I say pray like this, I want you to make this personal. This is not a corporate prayer. This is a personal prayer first. It'll never be effective in a corporate prayer until it is a personal prayer first. Because then there's power. It's personal. And, and it's, it's not just personal in some kind of a theology. It's personal in how I intend to live my life. It's personal because in this, I will know God. I will know Him. I will experience His presence. So I'm going to do something. I, I, I take eight things from this Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to just show you what it means personally to take these eight things my life, here's the eight things. Number one, my life keeps his name holy. This is personal. What I do with my life must keep his name holy. Then I will experience his presence. Number two, my life and my actions are looking for his kingdom to come. You want me to apologize for that? I'm not doing it. My life and my actions and my words and my thoughts and my motives are crying out for his kingdom to come. You know why? Because he said, pray like this. Lord, may your kingdom come. Number three, my life is surrendered so that his will is manifest in me just like it will be in heaven. Lord, make things down here like they are up there. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what I'm saying? My life is supposed to make things down here like they are up there, which means your presence is manifest through me. Number four, my life acknowledges and depends on the daily bread that comes from Him. Number five, my life acknowledges my sinfulness and cries out for His mercy and forgiveness. I don't deny my sinfulness. I don't deny my very nature. I cry out for His mercy and His forgiveness. Number six, my life then receives His forgiveness and turns around and freely gives that thing away that I received. I got free gift of forgiveness. I turn around and I give that forgiveness to other people. Number seven, my life requires much time in the closet of prayer, praying that I will not fall into temptation. Praying that I will not yield to temptation. Last one, number eight, my life acknowledges that the only way to be rescued from the evil one is the power of Christ. And you know what that looks like? His presence. His presence is the treasure. Those eight things in the Lord's Prayer are within your reach. 
and it is his treasure. It is his presence. It is the reward in the present life. The Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer. It is a life of knowing God, a life that knows God and then reveals God to others. But to my surprise, most people stop reading at verse 13. Everybody listen. Do you know most people read the Lord's Prayer and they stop at verse 13 and think he's done? He's not done. It's a sermon on the mount. He's not done. There's no page break here. You know what's next? What did you say? Heaven and earth are going to disappear. What did you say? What's next? Verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse, but if you refuse, but if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. One of these days, we are going to find out how big the word if is. It's a big word. You know what it means? If infers a condition. If you forgive others, you will be forgiven. But what if you don't? You don't have to guess the answer to that. What if question? What if you don't question? You don't have to guess. What did you say, Jesus? If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So I'm going to challenge this service, the same thing I did in the first two services. Um, I've said this on multiple occasions. I'm going to say it again today. I don't know your heart. I don't know if there's any unforgiveness in your life toward any person on this world. But I'm going to tell you this. If there is anybody in this lifetime that you harbor unforgiveness toward, today is the day you release it. You know how we read the scripture during communion time he says as your as your servants i beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of god's mercy and then ignore it do not accept this marvelous gift of god's kindness and ignore it. You know what his kindness is? He'll forgive you. And his condition is, I'm going to give you the seed of forgiveness in your life, but you'll have to give that seed of forgiveness in other people's lives too. That's what activates the presence of God. Number three. That brings up our final topic today called fasting. Before I read it to you, I want you to notice the four things in common. All three of them, pray, uh, giving, praying, and fasting. The card I passed out today, and these are just reminders, kind of something you can look at in the future. But on one side, it says this. What did you say, Jesus, about giving? What did you say about prayer? What did you say about fasting? And I want you to notice something that's, on, that's interesting to me. On the back side, it says this. They all begin with when you, not if you. Every one of them. Go read it. They all say when you. So if you're wondering whether or not the Christian life requires giving, if you're wondering whether or not the Christian life requires praying, if you're wondering whether or not the Christian life requires fasting, read the Sermon on the Mount. Number two, they all are best done in secret. All three. It also says they're also practiced by hypocrites. That's the watch out moment. Watch out. You know what? A hypocrite does all three of these. They give, they pray, and they fast. But all three of them, the hypocrites, do it for the wrong reason. They're doing it for self, to elevate self, to get a reward now. Somebody pat me on the back, make me look big. Wow, how spiritual they are. And the last one is they all have rewards. The question is whether or not the reward will be in the immediate or whether it will be from God. Now, fasting, verse 16. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I'll tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, not if, when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father 
who knows what you do in private, and your Father who sees everything will, what's those last two words? Reward you. I'm not sure the exact year I came to know the power of fasting to reveal the presence of God in my life. I'm going to guess it's about 21 years ago. It's just a guess. However, I can remember the time when I felt like God was going to open a door for me into some type of a full-time preaching ministry. I had just finished the Henry Blackaby Experiencing God study the first time, and I was so moved by the Holy Spirit and working in my life that I wanted so much to be obedient to God. But I was worried, and here, here's the real point. I, I was worried internally about missing what he had planned or being deceived by the adversary and messing up what God was about to do in my life. So I decided something. I decided I would fast in obedience to the Word of God, what I just read to you. I knew God was doing something, and my only way to be sure that it was from Him and not the enemy was this. I fasted on Mondays for three years. I look back and I find it incredible that I was able to do that for three years. For three years, I didn't eat. I would eat either on Sunday afternoon, usually it was after lunch, sometimes it was after the evening meal on Sunday, and I would not eat on Mondays at all until Tuesday morning. I did that for three years. And they were, it was specific. The fast was specific. Asking God to take me to the exact place he wanted me to be in my life. It was specific. It wasn't a general fast. It was, Lord, I am giving my life to you, my act of worship to reveal your presence and your purpose and your power in my life is I will give Mondays to you as an act of fasting, an act of worship. That was 19 years ago when I fasted for three years. Some of you might right now might say, well, I just read the scripture. I thought you were, that's supposed to be done in secret, so why are you bringing that up? At the time that I fasted, it was in secret. Now it is my testimony. And it is the power of a testimony that overcomes Satan. That time of prayer and fasting was how I came to know God. That time of prayer and fasting revealed the purpose of God in my life. Let me say, at the end of those three years of fasting, I did not have to guess. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. I knew exactly when I was supposed to do it. And even one of the prayers I had during that time is, once you convince me, you need to convince my wife that it'll be time for me to leave the business world and go into ministry. And he did that too. That time of prayer and fasting was how I came to know the will of God. It's how I came to experience the plan of God. I didn't tell anybody I was fasting. If you weren't very close to me during those three years, you would have no idea I was fasting. I didn't let people know about it. If you'd asked me out to lunch on Mondays, I would have politely said no. I don't eat on Mondays, but I didn't tell anybody that. That time of fasting led me here to this church 15 years ago. Just about two weeks ago, it's been 15 years. And God began to move in me and through me and around me. Every time since then, I felt the need to make a major decision or a major change, I would again start to fast. I remember, let me give you an example. I remember how difficult the decision was to build this facility. I remember that uh, I was a nervous wreck. We had already built that one complex up there, the adult education building, and that was a stretch at the time. Trust me, there weren't 800 people here when we made those decisions. And the idea of borrowing $2 million just put me in a heart murmur. So I made a decision. I did not publicly announce this decision, and if you were not very close to me, you had no idea I did this, or maybe never knew I did this. But when we, were going to make, when we were about to make a decision to build this complex, I fasted for 14 days. 14 days, I ate no food. Most of those first days, I only drank water. I started after that drinking one bottle of Gatorade a day because I was having so many charlie horses in my muscles. I could barely function after about five, six, seven days. For 14 days, I ate no food. Why? 
there's something I wanted more than food. I wanted the presence of God. It's like this picture of Moses when he's at the mountain and he's supposed to lead these children of Israel to the promised land. And he told God, God said, I'm not going to go with you because if I go with you, these rebellious people, I'll destroy them along the way. And Moses looks at God and says, if you don't go, I ain't going. And God was honored by that. And it was this idea that, Lord, I'm not, if you're not in this, I'm not going. And the idea of what's such a big deal? I'm going to tell you what, you fast 14 days, you'll find out what the big deal is. What do you desire enough to stop eating for? What is it, what treasure do you pursue? What are you after? What do you seek in life? This is not a weight loss program. It's not about having a diet. It's about the desire of your heart is so much wanting the presence and the purpose and the plan of God that you're willing to give up whatever you have to to receive it, to know it, and to live in it. Since that, and let me say this, when we finished that, four, when I finished that 14-day fast, I absolutely knew this was the will of God, and if you tried to talk me out of it, I'd have been strong against you. Because the reality is, once God confirms something in your heart, then it's man trying to talk you out of it. Since then, I've had several occasions to fast. On multiple decisions, I have fasted. I don't talk about it. I've not communicated that to very many people. I have not since fasted for 14 days. Why? Why all this fasting talk? There is something amazing that happens when you take food out of your life. There's a sense of spiritual clarity that I have found nowhere outside of this idea of fasting. But why? What's the whole point? What's the, what's the point of What's the point of giving? What's the point of praying? What's the point of fasting? He, Jesus has connected them. I didn't. He connected these three in one topic. Why? When you. He does not use the word if you. He uses the word when you. These are all best done in secret. They are all practiced by hypocrites and they all have rewards. When you give to the needy without seeking any reward in this life, you will receive the reward. And I'm going to tell you what the reward is. You will know God. You will experience His presence. I don't know what you're looking for in life, but let me tell you what the ultimate treasure is. It's the only thing that will survive the fire. It's His presence. When you pray in secret, not like a fake hypocrite, you will receive a reward. God promised you. What reward? You will know God. You will experience His presence. And when you fast in secret without drawing attention to yourself as a faker, you will receive a reward. What's the reward? You will know God. All three of them have the same reward. You will know God. You will experience His presence. Giving to the needy acknowledges that the gardener gave me some seeds to plant to produce a harvest, and they can only produce a harvest when I sow them. And by the way, they're not my seeds. Any money I might have, any time I might have, or any talents I might have, I acknowledge today publicly they were all given to me by God, the seed sower, the seed maker. He has only asked me to be a seed sower. And by giving away and acknowledging their source, I give him glory. Prayer develops and builds a relationship with the gardener that empowers me to recognize his voice. You know what prayer does? It empowers me to recognize his voice because there's another voice that speaks. And you better recognize the voice of God. When you talk to someone often enough, it's easy to recognize his voice and not be fooled by the imposter. When you talk to someone enough, spending a lot of time with them in quiet, you'll become like them. You'll start to take on their attributes and you'll take on their traits. And what's this idea of fasting? When you take away the daily bread, you will very soon begin to know the true bread that came down from heaven. Jesus looks at these Jewish people one day and he says, your forefathers ate manna in the wilderness and they all died. But I am the bread of life, and whoever eats this bread will never die. 
When you fast, something happens. It is the ability to understand the difference between earthly bread and the bread of heaven. The presence of God. What did you say? Heaven and earth are going to disappear, but these words will never disappear. These eternal words of Jesus are the very foundation of a civilized society. They are the very foundation of our democracy. Without this civil order derived from the very words of Christ, there will be no order. I appreciate the guy's statement. He says, you won't be able to hire enough police. When people throw away the word of God, there will be anarchy. And know this, every word that I have talked about in these six sessions on the, parable, on the Sermon on the Mount are within your reach. I think the thing that blows me away the most is this, and I'm going to close with this thought. Today I have outlined giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. Everything that God has announced to us to access his presence, you can reach it. He didn't ask you to do a single thing that you can't do. Nothing. You can give. You can give to the needy. You can't, it's not about giving. Well, I don't have, you don't have to give what you don't have. But what you ha can't, what you do have, you can share it. And you can pray. Well, I don't have time to pray. A oh, baloney. You don't have time to pray? Oh, yes, you do. You just haven't figured out what treasure is yet. Well, I, I, fasting, you know, that's kind of kooky. Well, I didn't say fast for 14 days. Could you fast for one day? Uh, for a purpose, for a purpose. Maybe there's something in your life you're struggling with. You want to encounter the presence and purpose and will of God in your life? Why don't you try fasting? You can experience the very presence of God. That's what all this is about. He'll give you a reward. He'll give you a reward. He'll give you a reward. Did you hear him? You can experience the very presence of God. You can know the king, and you can experience the kingdom. This whole Sermon on the Mount thing is about the kingdom of heaven, and it's not a place. It's a person. His name is Jesus. You can take hold of this treasure and this king. I'm going to ask Chad to come on out for this invitation time. But will you? All three of these are within your reach. And the question has always been the same. Will you? Will you be a giver or a taker? Will you be a prayer? Will you fast? When something in your life is critical, would, would, you, would you give up everything to encounter the presence of God and the power that's manifest? Here's why I asked that. Jesus said, watch out. The day in which you can may be drawing to an end. There's a day right now. All of you can reach these three. You can be a giver. You can be a prayer. You can fast. They're all three within your reach. He hasn't asked us anything that's, well, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. But there is a day that's coming in which you will no longer be able to. But right now we can. Last Sunday I stood here and I asked you a question. Would you dare, would you dare pray that the Holy Spirit would overcome your life, that you would be overcome by the Spirit, that every part of you would come under the authority of Christ. Would you dare pray that prayer? Not, not to say, Lord, can I have more of your Holy Spirit, but to say, Lord, would your Holy Spirit have more of me? Do you desire? Is this the treasure you seek? It is within our reach. The invitation's open.
Your presence. 